All right. Okay. Excellent. All right, guys. Well, great to see everyone. Welcome once again to our Sunday service. And uh, I'll be sharing the, uh, the sermon for us today. It's great to have all of you guys here. It's great to have YMYP, young marrieds, young parents joining us. And thank you so much, Teresia, for your wonderful communion sharing and just being so, so real and so vulnerable. I think if, if that's your first communion sharing, I, I look forward to many more because I think that was wonderful. And a great job, uh, Dio, as well, for introducing and, and making your wife feel comfortable and special. I think you did a great job. So awesome, guys. It's, it's great to be back here on Sunday. Um, I know we are still in the midst of, of a pandemic, but I'm always encouraged when I get to see everyone's faces. And so it's great that everyone's more or less putting their cameras on these days, which is encouraging. It's always good to see people. Um, today, we're finishing off our final Sunday in the theme of no other foundation, right? We've been talking a lot about foundation. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I spoke about the idea of the temple and how um, we as the spiritual temple as Christians can learn a lot from the physical temple that, that is talked about in the Old Testament. Uh, last week, uh, Ombudi shared for Jem and he was talking about, you know, is Jesus really the chief cornerstone of our life or is he a decorative ornamental stone? And that was a great discussion about foundation. So today, I thought we could talk about what is the foundation of any healthy relationship? In any loving relationship, what needs to be the foundation? So I wanted to um, ask you guys a question, and I'm just going to share my uh, slides so we can all be on the same page here. Um, I want you guys to, to answer a question. If you can go to Menti, you can do it on your phones. Um, which of the following contributes most toward a healthy marriage? So I'm going to ask you guys to, um, to participate over here. And um, I want to know from you guys, if you go over to, to Menti and type in 813057, um, what do you think of these characteristics, of these qualities, which of these contributes most towards a healthy marriage, which of course is a, the best example of loving relationship that we can think of? Um, now, I know you might be thinking, well, how do you define these things, right? How do you define love? How do you define compatibility? In whatever way you understand those terms, just answer. You can pick two. Um, which of these two do you think contributes the most? So we're getting a, a bit of a mix, um, but mostly towards love and respect. Interesting. Compatibility is somewhat important for some. Similar background, culture. Uh, one brave person has gone where no one else has and put attraction because he's just being real. And I, I don't know why I'm saying he, I don't know why I'm saying he, but he's just being real. He's put attraction. Um, so for the most part, people are saying broadly love and respect. Interesting. And, um, you know, I was thinking about this um, because there's a famous marriage researcher by the name of Gottman, who's done decades of research on marriage. And he's found that the most important qualities for a successful marriage are, in fact, love and respect. Um, so he's done a lot of research and he's found that couples that frequently show a lack of respect towards one another, uh, which is shown by criticism, contempt, um, defensiveness, or what he calls stonewalling. So he has these four different, um, if you like, interactions, which he calls the four horsemen of the apocalypse. He says in any relationship, if these four horsemen of the apocalypse are frequent, criticism, uh, defensiveness, contempt, stonewalling, uh, then those relationships have a much, much higher chance of ending up in divorce. And he talks about how love and respect are really important, how couples need to learn to fight without being hostile, without being defensive. They need to learn how to take responsibility for their mistakes. They need to learn how to reconcile. And couples that are able to do that have the highest chances of being satisfied in marriage. So love and respect these are very important qualities um, in marriage. And when you think about it, you know, is it possible um, to actually love someone without respecting them? What do you guys think? Go back to your mentee page, don't close it. Can you love someone without respecting them? And that's just an interesting thought that I had. You know, is it possible to actually love someone without respecting them? Interesting, I'm interested to see what you guys think. Um, what does that mean? Can you love someone without respecting them? 
So for the most part, people, wow, that's actually more than I thought. Interesting. Okay, maybe I don't need to do this sermon then, actually, because it seems like you guys have already got the takeaway. So um, let's just go over to the next section of the sermon. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, that's kind of what I want to talk about today, because can you love someone without respecting them? That's a great response. Thank you guys for that. Let me go back to my, let me go back to my main slides. How do I exit this? All right, cool. Thank you guys for that. Very helpful. So overwhelmingly no, right? Um, interesting because can you imagine a relationship where you love someone but you don't actually respect them what would that look like if you love someone but you don't respect them can you imagine a marriage where um you know for example the husband says he loves the wife but i don't really respect your your cultural differences i don't respect your family i don't respect your freedom um you have friends outside of our marriage no no no. we have our own friends you have your own money no 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 no, no. we have our own money there's this idea of when, when, we, when we have a relationship that lacks respect, it almost becomes suffocating. It almost becomes, um, if you like, manipulative. Right? You have your own interests. You like, you like watching that on Netflix. You like watching Bridgerton on Netflix. No, there's no way. I don't respect that, right? <laughs> you know, can you imagine a relationship where there's no respect? Today, I want to explore this in the Bible, this idea of, of what a foundation of a relationship looks like. And I want to look at the Ten Commandments. Why? Because the Ten Commandments is really the starting point in the Bible for, for God's relationship with people. That's kind of like, the, the if you like, the table of contents. And that's how the Jews would view the Ten Commandments. There's obviously, there's over 600 laws, right, in the, old, in the um, Jewish um, Torah. But the Jews view the Ten Commandments as really the table of contents. And if you like, that's going to unfold and turn into the many different specific laws that's talked about in the Bible. So my slides are a bit blurry, are they? Okay. I hope they will become back. If my slides are blurry, I apologize. Hopefully they'll come. It's raining quite hard over here. So the uh, signal might be bad. Basically my slide says the 10 commandments and it turns up in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy five. But you know, how do, how do people try and sum up the 10 commandments? Well, there was a famous rabbi that lived 40 years before the time of Jesus by the name of Hillel. I've talked about him before. And he said this, he said, this is how you sum up the 10 commandments. Don't do to others what you wouldn't want them to do to you. And that was basically the famous, if you like Jewish understanding led by this famous rabbi that if you had to sum up the Jewish law into a sentence, do not do to others what you wouldn't have them do to you. Does it sound familiar? Because 40 years later, Jesus would flip it around and say it in the positive, right? Matthew 7, Jesus says, this is how you sum up the law and the prophets. Do to others what you would have them do to you. So Jesus flipped it around and actually summed up the Ten Commandments that way. But was Hillel wrong? You know, that what Hillel said doesn't appear in the Old Testament. There's no line in the Old Testament that says what you, what you don't, um, what, what you, what you hate don't do to others, you wouldn't want them to do to you. There's no line in the Bible that says that. So where did he get that from? Where did he get this idea from? Um, how does the Ten Commandments relate to us today as a Christian, right? For many of us here, we probably feel like it doesn't relate that much, right? We probably feel like when we face a moral dilemma, I typically don't go to the Ten Commandments, right? When you're struggling with a question, I typically don't go, hmm, what does the Ten Commandments say? Right? We typically think, hmm, what did Jesus do? How would Jesus deal with this? But it's interesting because Jesus, when he was faced with a question by the rich young ruler who asked him, how do I get to eternal life? Jesus says, follow the commandments, right? So the commandments, again, the commandments are like a touchstone for God's relationship with us, for how to be in right relationship with him. And I want us to learn from them because actually deep within the Ten Commandments, there's some significant meaning that we can understand about love's foundation, about what a foundation of relationship looks like. So today, the material that I'm using actually comes from a Jewish rabbi, a modern rabbi by the name of David Foreman. He's not a Christian. He's a, he's a Jewish teacher, but he's done this interesting um, teaching. I don't know if it's his own or whether he's derived it from others. 
But what he does is he digs into the Ten Commandments and he says there's actually three layers to the Ten Commandments. And when you understand each of these three layers and how they actually relate to each other, you learn an overarching theme about relationship with God. And I actually found this pretty fascinating. And I think you guys are going to find this interesting as well. So what are these three layers? Well, let's start with the first layer. Okay, the first layer of the Ten Commandments is that there are two tablets. If you remember, Moses went up Mount Sinai and he came down with two tablets. So God put the Ten Commandments on two separate pages, if you like. Now, why is that? Why did God have to put it on two tablets? I mean, could Moses not have said, you know, God, I've got to carry this back down. Do you mind shrinking the font size a little bit so it, so it fits in to one tablet because it's a little bit heavy for me? Why two tablets? That in itself suggests something, that maybe there's a, there's a split down the middle. Maybe there's, there's a difference between the first five and the second five. And we need to understand uh, what these two halves actually um, represent and what's the significance of these two halves. You know, a while ago, we had a gem talk. I don't know if you guys remember, some of you were there, where we were talking about um, Genesis and the creation and Marshall was leading a gem talk. And he said that the days of creation in Genesis actually have a parallelism. They have a parallel in that day one corresponds to day four, day two corresponds to day five. If you fold it up on itself, it's kind of a symmetry. And that's actually a very common thing that we see in the Hebrew writings is symmetry. And that when you fold it at the center, there's a, there's a, if you like, there's a parallel that matches through them. And we talked about that in Genesis and the creation, but actually what if that is what is happening over here? What if these five and the first five and the second five actually parallel each other? What if there's kind of a connection between these? And that's what I'm going to explore. That's what this rabbi is proposing. And I'm sure that this is not his own teaching. I'm sure that this is something that many um, Jewish interpreters of the Torah have, have noted. But I found this really interesting. And I think it's going to teach us something about our relationship with Jesus and how we can um, grow in our love for God. So let's start with this. I'm going to jump in. Um, commands one and command six. The first command is what in the, old te in the, in the Ten Commandments? Um, wait, let me go back. Actually, I, I, didn't, I need to address one more thing. Sorry, I forgot. Now, when we look at these two halves, right, the first half, what, what is different about the first half and the second half? The first half is talking about our relationship with God. And the second half is talking about our relationship with people. Now, wait a second. I know what you're thinking. Hang on a sec. I see number five. That's talking about people. That's talking about our parents, right? And you're right. So what is the commonality between, between our relationship with these over here, which is God and our parents, and our relationship with these over here, which is others, our peers. Well, the first half talks about our vertical relationship. You know, God is our creator. God gave us life. God gave us identity. In much the same way, our parents are also a vertical relationship. If you were to look at a family tree, your parents would always sit above you. And they gave you life. They gave you your, who you are today. Uh, they gave you your identity. They gave you your name. Right. To an extent, they gave you who you are. And so the first half has to do with how we relate vertically with those who gave us life. And the second half has to do with how we relate with others, our peers. So that's the first layer of this discussion in the, old, in the Ten Commandments. There's two tablets, there's vertical relationships, and there's horizontal relationships. And what we're going to see that as we compare the, the vertical with the horizontal we're going to see actually a theme develop from each one. So we're going to see five themes, five meta principles, if you like. And from those five meta principles, we're going to learn something. So that's the second layer. It's how these vertical and horizontal relationships um, actually express the same principle. So I hope you guys are still with me. Let's jump in. It's going to become clearer as we go along. So stay with me here, guys. So commandment one is I am the Lord, your God. Right. That is actually the first commandment. I'm the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt. Right now, what is that command? It's actually a command to acknowledge God as your savior. It's a command that that you need to remember who God is and what he's done for you. 
Uh, so the first commandment is really acknowledge who God is and what he's done for you. And commandment six is you shall not murder. So how are these two related? Well, if we go back to Genesis and we look at what is the significance of murder in the Bible, the very um, first time God speaks about um, the significance of murder, he says this in Genesis 9, he says, whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. So what is God saying here? He says, when you kill someone, you're actually killing the image of God because I have made all mankind in my image. That's the significance of human life. So let's think about the idea of murder. What motivates someone to kill someone? Well, there could be all kinds of reasons, right? It could be jealousy. It could be vengeance. It could be financial gain. It could be a crime of passion. But when you think about it fundamentally, when you believe in your heart that your life is better off without that person in the picture, that you think that what the best option, instead of trying to reconcile our differences, is to get rid of someone, then you have already uh, committed murder. And the first example of murder in the Bible is Cain and Abel. If you remember, uh, before Cain kills his brother Abel, God says to him, hey, Cain, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you don't do what is right, be careful, because sin is crouching at your door. It wants to have you, but you must overcome it. So rather than being reconciled and doing the right thing that God told him about, he actually couldn't deal with the fact that his brother was more accepted by God because of his offering. And he decided in his heart, my life is better off without my brother Abel in it. And he kills him. Now, imagine we took that same view towards God. Now, we can't actually kill God, right? We could not kill God. But what can we do in our hearts? We can do the next best thing, which is to ignore him, which is to say, do you know what, God? My life is better without you in the picture. My life is more convenient. My life is more satisfied. I don't have all these so-called laws and covenants and restrictions. My life is better without you, God. And so in your heart, you ignore him. You turn away. You kill God in your heart. It's interesting because when Jesus defines murder in Matthew 5, he doesn't talk about it as physically killing someone. He says, when you are unwilling to reconcile with a brother, when you're not willing to come together and, and, and be reconciled in your relationship, and when you're keeping unresolved anger and bitterness, you are already guilty of murder. Can you guys start to see the connection between I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and do not murder? The connection is this. You cannot ignore God. You cannot, um, you cannot turn away from God. God is the reason why you are alive. God brought you out of slavery. God has saved you. You cannot ignore him, and therefore, you cannot actually ignore others. You cannot remove someone from the picture. When you feel the urge that, when you feel like it's more convenient not to have someone in your life, do not give in to the temptation to get rid of them. Rather, recognize their existence, recognize their value as being made in the image of God, and be reconciled. So what is the, what is the principle? that we see from these first two, from one and six, don't do away with others. Do not do away with others. So that's going to be the first principle that connects commandment one and six. Let's continue, guys. Commandments two and seven. This one's a bit more straightforward, right? The second commandment in the, old, in the Ten Commandments is no other gods, no idols. And then the seventh commandment is no adultery. Do not commit adultery, right? Can you guys see the connection between those? I think it's a little bit simpler to see that these are both sacred relationships. These are both covenant relationships. Whenever we bring something else, a third party into that exclusive relationship, it becomes corrupted. It, it, it loses its, its preciousness. It loses its value. When, when, a, when a marriage it becomes corrupted by unfaithfulness, it creates incredible damage. In the same way, when our relationship with God becomes corrupted by the introduction of something else which we worship, which God calls an idol, then it becomes corrupted and it loses its purity. The point here is that these are sacred relationships and we need to honor them and we need to protect them. 
So the second principle is don't betray sacred relationships. Okay, that's the second principle we're getting from these connections. Let's continue. Commandments three and eight, right? Commandment three is do not misuse the Lord's name. We often hear that being translated as don't take the Lord's name in vain. And how does that connect to the eighth commandment, which is do not steal? This is a bit of a tricky one. But the, the rabbi that I was um, studying this from was saying that the Hebrew in this actually gives us a very um, strong hint as to the connection. So the Hebrew word for stealing, for steal, is actually like the same word used for kidnap when you're, when you're taking someone. So that's the word that the Hebrew is using for do not steal. It's kind of strange. It's talking about do not kidnap. And the Hebrew word for, do, um, for misuse, um, misusing the Lord's name or taking the Lord's name in vain, is like lifting off or carrying away. It's carrying something away as if it's as if the Lord's name is an object or a tangible thing. So how is that related to stealing? Well, have you ever had something stolen from you? Can you guys think of a time where you had something stolen from you? Maybe you can put in the chat. Um, what are some things that you've had stolen from you? Anyone want to put in the chat um, as you as you're thinking of this? For me, I remember that. I had a gold necklace that was given to me by my grandmother and it had a small cross on it. And I was wearing it, trying to look cool when I was a teenager and I was in London and I was going into a dodgy part of town. And this guy came over to me out of nowhere and grabs the necklace from my neck and tore it off from my neck. And I remember thinking, you know what I felt after that happened? I felt personally violated. Have you ever felt that when something's been taken from you you feel a sense of violation. Why? Because it's something, it, it's something about the object that belongs to you that you now know is being misappropriated and, and used by someone else. And that actually is very, very much a violation because someone has said that that object is more valuable to me than it is to you, right? I'm going to take that from you because I see more value in it for me. And I'm going to take it away from you. And, and what it is, is it's a misappropriation of something that actually reflects and is part of your personhood, a part of who you are, right? When you know that someone is out there with my gold necklace, when I, when I think about that, someone is out there with something precious to me and, and does not appreciate the value of it, that is actually something that is a violation, right? Some people are saying I got the Nokia stolen. Interesting. Charizard, okay, <laughs> from the Pokemon days. Um, whatever it is for you, do you remember what that felt like? Right? The point here is that uh, when you steal something, you devalue the object to the person who owns it and you say it's worth more than me and you violate that person. So what's the connection between taking God's name and misusing it and stealing is that you, you should not violate the personhood of others. When you take God's name and you, and you cheapen it, you're actually devaluing God's identity in your life and in your actions. You're violating God's personhood. That's why it's that's why it's actually important to God not to use the God's name, not to use Jesus Christ as a, if you like, as an expression of frustration, because we're misappropriating something that is important to God's personhood. So that's the connection. We're going to come back to these. So bear these in mind. Let's continue before we get too caught up. Um, four and nine. Are my slides clearer, by the way? Can you guys see my slides a bit clearer now? Awesome. Okay. Keep the Sabbath. And no false testimony. Okay, so no false testimony, the language being used there is like legal language. It's like being in a courtroom. Do not go and give false testimony in a court about your neighbor. That's the kind of idea that's being communicated over there. How does this relate to keeping the Sabbath? Now, for a Jew, what, what did the Sabbath represent? Well, it represented rest, sure. But where did that rest come from? Sabbath is actually a storytelling. It's a testimony to the fact that God created the earth and he rested on the seventh day. And to remember who God is, that he's your creator, to remember that he made you not for work, but he made you for worship. And you take a Sabbath to tell that truth publicly to others and to acknowledge that in your own life, that my life is not about work. My life is not about the productivity and, and the value of, of my achievements. My life is more than that. And, and Sabbath is how you get in touch with that truth about who you are, who God is, and you remind yourself about your creator. 
So in that sense, keeping the Sabbath and not take, not um, lying about your neighbor are one and the same thing. It's a truth telling. So what's the principle? Um, safeguard the truth. We have to safeguard the truth. Okay, final one. Uh, commandments 5 and 10. Honor your father and mother and do not covet. Now, again, this seems kind of like a strain. Like, how do we connect that? Well, it's very interesting what was um, said in this discussion about this. Um, when you think about um, the commandment to not covet and you read the, the, the commandment, if you guys know it, it actually talks about do not covet this. Do not covet your, your neighbor's house. Do not covet your neighbor's wife. Do not covet their ox. Do not covet their donkey. Do not covet their alpha. Do not covet their pambantu, right? It's like a long list that just continues, right? And why is it? Why, why doesn't it just say do not covet? Why, why can't God just say, do not covet? And that's clear enough, right? I mean, we get it. Don't covet. The point is that God is expressing the obsessive nature of coveting, of, of jealousy. It's an obsessive thing. When you want one thing, actually, when you get it, there's going to be another thing that you're coveting. Mm. An example that was given was um, this, this person called um, Joe, um, has a neighbor called Dave. This neighbor Dave gets this brand new TV. It's a huge TV. And he all he can think about is Joe's TV. All Dave can think about is I just want Joe's TV. And he's so he's so obsessed with it, he goes and gets counseling. And he goes to the therapist and he says, I just can't stop thinking about Joe's TV. I don't know what it is. I just really need the TV. And so the, the therapist says to him, Well, I've got an idea. Instead of spending so much money on these counseling sessions, why don't we take that money and we go and buy the TV? So Dave says, that's a great idea. So he goes and buys the TV. And after a couple of weeks, he finds himself back with the therapist. And he's asking the therapist, he says, I got the TV, but actually I just really realized that what I needed was the car. I needed his car. And I just can't stop thinking about the car. And the therapist says, well, why don't you use this money and go and put a down payment on the car? He says, that's a great idea. So he goes off, he buys the car. In a couple of weeks, he comes back and he says, I just can't stop thinking about Joe's wife. I saw her the other day and it's just, I just can't get her out of my mind. And the therapist says, I think we have a deeper issue. I think there's a deeper issue going on here. That's the nature of covetousness is that it doesn't stop when you get the item that you're coveting because it's rooted in something deeper than that. Coveting is saying, my life is so miserable. My life is so flawed that I want to crawl out of my own life and just get any someone else's. I just want to go into someone else's life because that would make me happy. That would make me satisfied. That would make me content. There's something so wrong with what I have and what's been given to me. Mm. Can you see the connection between honor your father and your mother, a vertical relationship and this horizontal relationship about how we view others? The connection is that we need to be content with what has been given to us. Mm. Our parents gave us life. Our parents gave us the looks that we have. Our parents gave us some kind of identity. Now, they may have failed in other aspects of parenting, but they did a very good job of that. They did a very good job of giving you life, giving you who you are to some extent. To honor your father and mother, therefore, is actually about being satisfied and content with what you have received from them and not fixating on other people's lives. What's the principle that God is trying to tell us from this connection? Don't do away with yourself. Don't forsake yourself. Be content with yourself. So that's the layer two that we get from this. So let's keep moving on here. What's the point here? Layer one, we talked about two tablets, vertical relationships, horizontal relationships, right? Layer two, we talked about a parallelism, the connection, yielding these five meta principles. So what is layer three? Well, layer three, means that there must be something we can get from these five principles. There must be some takeaway that we can learn, some overarching theme that we can pull out from these. Let's look at the five principles again. Number one was don't do away with others. Don't ignore God and don't kill others. Don't turn your back on others. Be reconciled. So don't do away with others. Two, don't betray sacred relationships. Three, don't violate the personhood of others. Four, safeguard the truth. Five, don't do away with yourself. So what do we see here? You know, there's actually a difference between the first four and the fifth. Mm. Look at these principles. 
Remember what Rabbi Hillel said. Do you remember what I started off at the beginning of the sermon? Rabbi Hillel, 40 years prior to Jesus, started this conversation about how do you summarize the law? And he didn't get it from the Torah. He made it up. He said, do not do to others what you would not have them do to you. Now, look at this. Look at these five principles here. Can you see where he gets that from? Look at the first four. Don't do these things to others. Don't do away with others. Don't betray their sacred relationships. Don't violate them. Don't uh, safeguard the truth about them. Every aspect of a person, their body, you know, don't, don't kill them. Um, their relationships, um, their reputation, their, the truth about them. Don't violate them. Don't do to others. Number five, don't do away with yourself what you wouldn't want them to do to yourself. Isn't that interesting? Jesus flipped it around and took it a step further and said, do to others what you would want them to do to you. But why did Jesus say that? You know, between these two people, between Hillel, this famous rabbi, and Jesus, you know, Jesus was not making this up on the spot. Jesus was speaking this into a context Mm. that Jews knew that this was the conversation going on from Hillel. And Jesus came in and said, wait a sec, do to others what you would have them do to you. And he flipped it on his head. Why? Which of them is correct? Actually, both of them are correct. You see, what was Hillel trying to get at? Hillel was trying to get at this. When you look at these principles, What's the word that summarizes all of these? What's the overarching theme? I wouldn't say it's love. I would say it's respect. It's a respect for others. It's a respect for the sanctity of another human being. It's a respect for yourself. And and if everyone else is sacred, if everyone else has some of God's image in them that I shouldn't violate them, then maybe I myself also have that image of God within me. And therefore, I should not violate myself. Both Hillel and Jesus were actually speaking the same truth. Hillel was talking about respect and Jesus was talking about love. And when they come together, we have a true understanding of what love truly is. You see, love cannot be expressed without respecting someone. Mm. If you can't respect someone, then actually you can't learn to love them. What does it look like to love God, but not respect him? Well, when, it, when you love God without respecting him, do you know what that looks like? It looks like idolatry because you say, God, I'll love you. I want to worship you on Sunday. But, but during the week, the thing that I really respect, the thing that I really care about is money. And I just want to focus on that during the week. But God, I love you on Sunday because that's, that's how I show my love to you. But, but there's other things in my life. You see, when you, when you try to love God without respecting him, It's not really love at all. What you respect most is what you give the most power to in your life. When you respect something, you lift it up, you give it power and you worship it saying, I'm going to get something from this. This is what I believe is going to give me the most value in my life, the most peace, the most comfort, the most money, the most security. That's what it looks like when you when you love God, but you don't respect him. What does it look like in our relationship with others when we love others, but we don't really respect them? Let's talk about it in a work setting. How about with your colleagues? When you, when you love them, but you don't respect them, how do we see them? Well, we just see them as people that can actually elevate our career. Is that how you see your colleagues in work? Or do you see them as human beings that are loved by God? How do you see your colleagues? Is it, I just want them to make me look good in front of my boss? How about for those of you who have employees, whether it's in, in, in a business or whether it's at home, um, whether it's your maid, your helper, your driver, do you, do you respect them? Mm. Do you really respect them? Do you, do you think about, are they content? Are they happy in their work? Is there anything that I can do to make them happier? And you're saying, yeah, of course, give them more money. But, but do you really respect them? Do you really respect them that see them that they have equal value to God mm. and that God loves them too? You can't love someone if you don't respect them. How about in romantic relationships? For those of you who are single, I know some of you, you know, face a huge amount of pressure from culture, from family, um, particularly for the single women. And I pray for you guys. I, I really do pray for you guys regularly that you find someone. But I pray that you also find someone who really respects you, not just says he loves you. Right. Why? Because when you love someone without respecting in romantic relationship, it means that you're looking to get something from that person. 
I, I love this person because they're attractive or because of their family background, but I don't really respect them for who they are. I, I really pray that you find someone that, that truly respects you, respects your characters, respects your, your preferences, respects you, who you are, respects your spirituality, Amen. respects your relationship with God. How about in church? Um, when we're, for, for those of us maybe that are visiting church, visiting Gem here, what do you think about? Do you really respect the, the community of God? Or is it, what can I get from this service? Yeah. How can I benefit from this community? How can these people elevate my life? You know, relationships without respect all, almost always become about self. Wow. How are your relationships today? Are you selfish in your relationships with others? Are you self-seeking? How about the marrieds here? Do you respect your spouse enough to be what they need from you? Or are you trying to change them into what you think you need from a spouse? Do you respect them enough to appreciate that they are different? They have different ways of thinking and that's okay. I've had to really grow in that area in my marriage to, to learn to, to respect our differences and to, to know that we have different ways of doing things. And that's all right. That doesn't make me better than you. How are we doing in our marriages in respecting one another? How are you doing in, in, in sharing the gospel with others? Do you respect people enough to share God's word with them, to share the most valuable thing that you have? Do you respect them enough to, to want to share the good news with them? How about the other brothers and sisters in this community? Do you respect one another in friendship? Do you guys actually, do, do the brothers here really have the heart to encourage the sisters, to lift them up, to see that these are my sisters in Christ and I respect them? You know, the Bible calls the brothers here to treat other sisters as, to treat other women, young women in the church as sisters. Do we really see them that way? Do we respect them that way? Love has to be based on a foundation of respect. You cannot love someone until you really learn to respect them. Jesus was speaking love into a foundation of respect. I hope that we can learn to see that our love for God and for others needs mm -hmm. to be based on respect. So I'm going to close it up just by um, sharing these verses with us from Romans 12. And, um, and I want to ask you guys to reflect on how you can show respect to others this coming week. So this is Romans 12. It's coming from the message version, which is um, a little bit of a modern millennials version, but it's okay. I like what it says here. Uh, <laughs> Romans 9, 12 verses 9. Mm -hmm. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master. Care cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears when they're down. Mm. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Mm. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. Mm. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. Absolutely, that is love. Paul is challenging the Christians to show love. But what sits beneath that love is a deep respect for one another, not just in the church, but outside the church, even our enemies. How are we doing, brothers and sisters, in respecting God's creation? and God himself. So my practical for you guys is learn how to show loving respect to someone this week. Make it a challenge for yourself. Maybe it's someone in the church. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's um, a family member. I want to encourage you guys to write down right now someone that you want to grow in your respect towards this week. The kind of respect that we've been talking about today. And I pray that this can be used uh, by God to really build um, your character, build the kingdom, and to glorify God. Thank you, guys. I'm going to close in a prayer, and then we'll uh, close up our service together. Father God, Lord, thank you, God, for this time to, to share your word and to just learn myself about how the Ten Commandments reveal 
deeper meanings, God, about what foundation of love should be. I pray, Lord, that we can learn this, this quality of respect, which sometimes we forget. And we think love is all about feelings and we think love is all about just um, what we say. But love is really based on this foundation of, of a deep respect, God, a deep respect and reverence of you and respect for the sanctity and value of, of, of human beings, God. I pray, Lord, that we can grow in this area, that we can learn to love despite the differences. We can learn to serve despite our own hurts and feelings, and we can glorify you, Lord. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Amen. Thank you, TJ. Uh, thank you for the opportunity given to me to respond.